first hymn this morning that is uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, number 51 in the hymn book, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
139, Jesus is the very responsibility, number 139. Overwhelmed 
by the circumstances of daily life. Okay, we continue to pray for Brenda, Nancy, Scott, and Dorothy. As you promised, be a shelter for the homeless, savior to the lost, healer to those in pain, and one who watches over the orphan and widow. Walk alongside those who are in the shadow of death and grant your comfort to those who mourn. Loving and generous God, we thank you for all the blessings that you so richly pour into our lives, the gift of family and friends, the gift of love that surrounds us on every side, the gift of joy that reminds us you are always near, the gift of faith when we've needed the most. Father, you promised your well beloved son that the two or three are gathered together in your name, you will hear their requests. And each of our prayers has been best for us so that we can praise you more and more, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, your Son Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. And I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For now is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, the boys enjoyed the rich variety of different things during our ministry music uh, moments and was it your idea or my idea? <laughs> our, our, our idea. <laughs> your idea. Uh, to do a bit of a hymn sing and um, so we thought we'd uh, have a chance uh, to do that. We're going to uh, try uh, three, three different ones. We're just going to sing what the three first three verses, three verses in each one. You can say sitting for this and it'll be a bit more relaxing than the other one. So, we're going to start off with uh, number 152, Ferris for Jesus, and the first three verses. You know.
stories of Jesus. First three verses.
It can bring forth life and it can bring forth death, or let there be life to stay. Amen. One 
been hearing bits and pieces of the story of Abraham for the past few weeks. Ishmael and Hagar were banished to the desert, and Isaac had come this close to being a burnt offering to the Lord. But now we come to chapter 24. Abraham's wife, Sarah, has died. She was buried in the land of the Hittites in a place called Machpelah. The body was wrapped in a shroud, lay in a cave, and it was a funeral that attracted many. After her tomb was sealed by a large stone, Abraham turns and sees his son Isaac. With Sarah's death, Abraham's concern over the family line surfaces again. Ishmael, of course, is out of the picture, and Isaac, sadly, is not married. He's 40 years old, unemployed, lives with his parents. <laughs> Mark, sorry, Mark and Rebash were not as much as a concubine split between his bed sheets. For those of you who remember the television series Seinfeld, Isaac is the George Costanza of the world. <laughs> so Abraham's worried. What if Isaac's descendants? Where are they going to come from? Is there not a woman among the Canaanites or the Hittites whom Isaac would find pleasing? Apparently not. But Abraham is not so old that he cannot remember the women of his youth, the bronze beauties of the land of the Chaldeans. Maybe a wife for Isaac could be found among Abraham's homeland. So with the hope of having descendants numbering more than the stars of heaven, Abraham sends one of his servants back to his ancestors in order to find a suitable match for his son. And that's where we come into the story of Genesis today. The servant of Abraham takes ten camels, all sorts of jewelry, gold, and even diamonds, which then were a girl's best friend, <laughs> in hopes of finding an attractive woman in my reality. The journey would have taken months, and the servant travels alone, but he is faithful, fulfilling the desires of the father of the country. Finally, the servant arrives at a well in the middle of the wilderness. He travels a great distance. He's tired and it's evening. He needs a place to stay for the night. The bags are unpacked, ten pegs driven into the ground, and the servant sees a woman approaching, doing an ordinary task. She comes to draw water from the well. Rebecca is her name, and according to Genesis, she's young, attractive, single. <laughs> And the servant of Abraham began talking, and out of this discussion, the servant begins to pray, seeking the Lord's guidance. If this woman, if this woman who, who bore jugs of water would also be the woman to bear the children for God's promises. Rebecca doesn't know the God of Abraham, but she knows about Mideaster hospitality. As the story unfolds later on in the chapter, she says, we have plenty of strong fathers. We have a place for you to stay for the night. And as the evening progresses, stories are told, gifts exchanged, wine is poured, a meal is shared. And in the midst of all those festivities, something truly sacred begins to take shape, because even by the next morning, Rebecca agrees to go with Abraham's servant. Food and water gathered for the journey, the servant returns with joy to the land of Canaan. And as they approach the dwelling tent of Abraham, Rebecca sees a man in the distance. It's Isaac. Their eyes meet. It's love at first sight. It's all very romantic. <laughs> and Abraham also knows the good will of the hospitality. He too has plenty of straw and fodder and a place to stay for the night. And as the story from Genesis concludes, Isaac and Rebecca, they get married. And Abraham can rest once again, knowing that God does provide. All of this, the trust between strangers, the birth of living relationships, the grace of love and an abundance of joy, all this and more coming from that simple act of hospitality. But turning to Matthew's Gospel, Jesus sounds a little upset. Not really very hospitable at all. For those of you who think that Jesus only got mad when he cleansed the temple, you can read this passage from Matthew again. Jesus lashes out against the crowds and the religious establishment with long speeches and vicious accusations. And for some unknown reason, 
he focuses much of his wrath on the cities like Chorazan, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, cities where great powers and wonders had been performed. Places that at least had the reputation for being the centers of great faith and religious vitality. But Jesus, as is often the case, sees things a different way. Jesus believes that the pagan cities that have tired aside would have responded better to his message of repentance than the Jewish cities like Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. In fact, so angry is Jesus about these three cities that he sees their fate will be worse than that of Sodom. Now Matthew would talk about the ancient city of Sodom more than any other gospel. It's an important image as he writes this story. Sodom, that great Old Testament city, was utterly destroyed, leveled to the ground, wiped off the face of the earth with burning fires from above because of its sinfulness. You may remember the story. <coughs> the angels of the Lord looked upon the evil and perverse residents of Sodom, and not one, not even one righteous person could be found. Punishment was swift, condemnation permanent, and in a moment, Sodom was obliterated with burning sulfur from above. <laughs> so, a little biblical pop for this for you. Something fun to do on a Sunday morning, right? What sin did God find so detestable? What was the abomination in the eyes of the Lord that he summoned up the fires of heaven to kill every man, woman, and child in the, in the city of Sodom? What was it? Homosexuality would be the common answer. Any other guesses? I, I don't worship. I don't worship? Sort of. I worship God, that was part of it too. Well, your sermon's called It's All About Hospitality. <laughs> Someone's paying attention. One of that in tidbits, I can be <laughs> Dennis is 19. When Lot visited the city of Sodom, of Sodom, he wasn't well received. The people of the city found out where he was staying. They shouted at him from the street, burst into the place where he'd been enjoying the supper, dragged him out of the gutter and beat him up. Their transgressions of Sodom really don't have a lot to do with various expressions of human sexuality. Common belief, but if you look at the passage more clearly, there's something more going on there. Sodom was destroyed because of a lack of hospitality. And in the Gospel reading, Jesus sees the same kind of destruction on the horizon for cities like Chorazin and Bethsaida. Despite his miracles, Jesus has been driven away from places like Capernaum. No one has welcomed Jesus into their homes. No one in those cities has welcomed him into their hearts. These cities are indeed. But by the end of the passage from Matthew, Jesus isn't quite so angry as he was at the beginning. He's had a chance to calm him down. And he turns from his anger, connects and reconnects to something more, something deeper. Jesus turns from wanting to destroy to wanting to welcome. He gets in touch with the hospitality, the rest deep in the heart of God. Come to me, he said. Come, come to me, everyone who's weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He continues and turns to you when he turns to me and says, Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, I am gentle and humble of heart, and I promise. I promise you will find rest for your souls. Jesus calls us to remain with him and to take my yoke as he be. Take my word as mine. No conditions in what Jesus says. No big long list of requirements that needs to be met before we come into his presence. Jesus is the one who initiates the invitation. Given and remains. Given for you and remains for me. Complete acceptance. Unconditional love irresistible grace waiting for you to find rest from all the trouble and come home. That's what
ask for Calvin to love. Calvin being nice and polite. Hospitality is not about having a matching cover with your little nap and swallow and chip swans on your own. <laughs> it's about knowing and knowing that you know and knowing that you know that you know that you're loved. How much you're accepted. How much you're forgiven. The truth is you are loved without regrets. You are accepted without limits. And you are forgiven even though your sins are many. Hospitality says everyone is welcome and no one is turned away. Mm-hmm. It's about that mansion in those many rooms. It's a table where our deepest hunger is satisfied. It is a love that is undying and eternal. It's that living water from that well that never runs dry. I'm saying all we're we're ahead of living and I will give you rest, Jesus said. He welcomes all. Mm-hmm. You and I need to do the same. But this radical grace of hospitality in which all are welcomed sometimes makes me feel uncomfortable. Because it challenges my assumptions. It turns our way of thinking and seeing things sort of upside down. I'm pretty good at welcoming people that, are, that I like, that I agree with, and even though I get along with. But Jesus is inviting us today to welcome people that I don't like, that I do not agree with, that I do not get along with. And I hate that. (laughs) He's right. He is right. Jesus knows what he's talking about. Hospitality changes us, peels back the curtain, and invites us to see one another in a new and living way. Hospitality is a way that we can welcome the other and do so with joy. To love the other, and do so with quietness and humility. Embracing them as if they were part of ourselves. Hospitality requires no demands that we are open, vulnerable, and willing to be wounded for the sake of love. It has its risks. It means that you and I might get hurt, but that is our calling. That's the cost. When you welcome me into your world and into your lives and into your hearts, I need to remember that I am trading on some sacred ground. I need to walk carefully, walk slowly, and walk with reverence and respect. So we go, we go carefully into each other's lives, and we do so with love. When we practice hospitality, we no longer look at one another from a human point of view, for we are all in your creation. Reverence for all that is holy in you, reverence for all that is holy within me. Hospitality rejoices in infinite variety, making the strange familiar and the familiar strange, dancing on the path of the unknown, with wonder and curiosity at its side. This is something that Abraham's servant found when he saw Rebecca coming to draw water from the well. Charity will spend time and listen to one another, allow a relationship with a stranger to develop into a moment where a promise could be fulfilled. Maybe that's what hospitality is really all about. A place where you and I can be together. Where you and the stranger come closer and become known and loved as old assumptions are just washed away. And we're surprised by joy. You open your heart and I open mine, and in a moment of sheer grace, God comes to dwell in our midst. We're led into something new, and we take yet another step closer towards the kingdom of God.
world, the instruments of peace, ambassadors of Christ. To be kind to one another, and as much as possible, live in harmony with everyone. Forgive one another, as the Lord has forgiven you. Love one another, comfort the afflicted, serve one another with a quiet mind. Remember to be holy, as the Lord your God is holy. For all the what is good, avoid every kind of evil. Do these things, and the Lord shall be with you wherever you go. Amen.